Hello, everyone. <laughs> oh, my. I feel like we haven't done this in forever. Mm -mm. Like, what do we even say? Hello, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the Anna Karenina debate for Dickens and Tolstoy. I feel like we haven't done this in so long and that we've had the two months to read the book. So I'm just so yeah. excited to hear what you guys have to say about it. And Emma and I are really excited to talk about it because we have quite conflicting opinions, don't we? We do, we do. <laughs> so I was just reading, we were just reading the comments of who's read it and who hasn't and what you guys think of it. And I would love to know your star ratings. Hi, Lucy. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Oh my gosh. So we are going to be structuring this like all of our other debates where we will talk about the background of the book, our unbiased opinions, and then we will talk about our ratings and everything, then the author's life writing, um, character, and I have so much written down, and then we'll have intent, favorite quotes at the end and everything, and then we will obviously vote. So if you guys haven't voted yet, then you can do that on my Instagram story or on my YouTube community tab. Um, so yes, you can tell us after reading Anna Karenina what you thought, whether you were Dickens or Tolstoy. So okay. <laughs> this is this is my favorite book ever. So get ready to. Uh, I know. I think yeah. get ready for a fight. Will we be friends after this? I don't know. I don't know. Well, you already. I already said some things. I can't say <laughs> Emma and I have talked a little bit about it, not too much, but she has already said some things that I'm ready to fight her on. So. Okay. 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 So, um, do you just want to give first your overall thoughts on the book? Maybe your star rating and. Okay. Yeah, so this was also my second time reading it. It was both our second time reading it. Um, the first time I really enjoyed it. The second time I enjoyed it like less, for sure. I think especially after reading War and Peace. Um, I don't want to compare them too much in this debate, although like a little bit, but just after War and Peace and like I feel like what <laughs> we went through with that book and like what it meant, um, at least like to me, but to both of us, I think I was just like, oh, what? what is this? I feel like I, <laughs> I feel like I got to Anna and I was like, I really don't care that much. Um, and I don't know, like I gave it four stars, which was the same rating I gave it the first time, but it's still amazing. Like it's still brilliant. Don't, I'm not gonna be like, oh, this book sucks, but um, mm -hmm. it just wasn't like, it's not something I'm interested in. It's not something I love like as much um, as War and Peace or a lot of other classics. So um, yep. But no, it was still amazing, but just not like it didn't it didn't do anything for me, I think, in the end. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. it's OK. <laughs> I think <we're> <laughs> um, yeah, I kind of feel like everyone knows that this is my favorite book. So like, what do I even say about it? Um, it's just it's just everything that I love. And I, it's just so funny to hear what you have to say about it and I'm really interested to kind of see your critiques because to me, I I see the things that people could maybe um, dislike about it or that could deter them from enjoying the book as much as I do. So it's just, I'm interested to see what we yeah. have to say. But yeah. yeah, I mean, I just feel like this book, I don't know, I was saying this in my vlog, like it felt, it feels like I was born to read it and that Tolstoy kind of you know, like not wrote it for, for me, but like he wrote it for all of us. And, yeah. and I feel like it's just one of those things that you read it and you feel like you're home and the words just like impact you more than other words. And so. Yeah. Well, like what, I don't know. What do you love? Like not most, but like, yeah. Um, Levin. <laughs> I mean, just the character, like all of the characters feel I don't know, they feel like friends, they feel like family. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's just, it's like the truth and the beauty of the story. And he explores so many themes that are timeless. And even though this was written so many years ago, we can all relate to different aspects of it, even though so much time has gone by. Um, and just like the, the things that Tolstoy talks about, the way that he writes them, affects me in a way that I think not a lot of writing does. Yeah. So, 
Yes. We will get more more into this. I feel like I have like specific reasons of okay, okay, love it okay, later okay. on. But okay. yeah, okay. So, um, just a little background on the book. We will obviously do non spoilers in the beginning, and then we will warn everyone when we go into spoilers if you don't want to be spoiled because I know a few of you haven't read the book yet. Um, so the book was originally released in serial installments from 1875 to 1877, and then. It was finally finished in book form in 1878, just to give you a little like background on the time period. Um, Tolstoy first ca called this book his like first true novel because War and Peace was more of this like un unexplainable piece of writing where no one really knew what it was. Was it, you know, like an epic? Was it a history? Was it a novel? So he really saw Anna Karenina as his first mm -hmm work of um, fiction, I guess, or well, not fiction, but novelization. Um, and I feel like we usually give synopses for each book for the debates. This one, I feel like is such a hard one to uh, kind of put into one sentence because there's so much that goes on. But I feel mm -hmm. like just touching on the major themes of this book will tell you what you need to know. Yeah. So it deals with themes of betrayal and jealousy and loyalty and faith and family and love and marriage, farming. farming, society, the country, the city. So it's just, it's just um, a configuration of basically mm -hmm. everything that encompasses life he kind of discusses in this book. So that's that. Um, and then I don't want to babble on for too long, but just a little background on the history of the book and how Tolstoy's life influenced the writing. So the story of Anna Karenina was actually inspired by a true story, a true, um, a woman that was real. And her name was Anna Stepanova Pirakova. I think I'm pronouncing that mm -hmm. correctly. Um, she was the mistress of one of Tolstoy's friends and Tolstoy himself observed her autopsy the following day after she um, was killed or um, killed herself. And he was troubled deeply by this woman's story and then as a result was inspired to write Anna Karenina. Um, he originally wrote Anna as more of a villainous character and see, kind of explaining or wanting to show like the demise of a fallen woman and how it's, how he, um, mm -hmm how he didn't agree with what she did. And through writing it, he started to sympathize with her character and kind of turned, the story went a different way that he expected. And I really think that that says so much about him as a writer and also what fiction can do. Um, because you can read about these people and sympathize with them and kind of change your opinion and justify why a person does certain things. and. Yeah. Uh, whether their actions are justified or not. Right. Um, something else is that I think it's really funny, just this little thing. So Tolstoy's wife actually said to him, Levin is you minus the talent after reading the first part of the book. And she also said that Levin is an impossible man. And if you don't know, um, it's commonly known that Levin is basically the most autobiographical version of Tolstoy in his writings. So... We will talk more about that, but mm -hmm. I find that really funny that, you know, his own wife said that to him. <laughs> um, okay, so we will now get into maybe like non-spoilery things yeah. about writing, because I know you have a lot to say about that. Yes, about cause, I do. <laughs> because no. the, the other day we were talking about what, like, who we prefer, Dickens or Tolstoy, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Emma did say... Something. I did say some things. Um, I think like like going through this debate is just so much fun because like you we love both of them, but like you really get to find out like like what you love and like what you love better in each of them. So I just like reading Anna Karenina. I mostly listened to it on audiobook actually this time, but um, it just like I don't know. It didn't hold me. It didn't like keep my interest. And like going back to reading Nicholas Nickleby, which we just started and is our next book. So just like reading that and going through the first few chapters like that, I think that's like my feeling of what you feel with like Tolstoy. Like it feels like, oh my gosh, yes, I wanna like like live in these little sentences that Dickens writes and like make a home there. And like, it's so, like, it's just so inspiring in terms of like the way you can see the world through your writing. Whereas like, especially in Anna Karenina because War and Peace just felt so like, 
I don't know, it felt like it broke a lot of like bounds and stuff like that. But with Anna Karenina, it just feels very like compact and it feels like you're a little bit just like trapped, which like is in a sense what the effect that he wants to create. But even when we go to like, you know, the countryside and like the nature writing in Anna Karenina is like probably like my favorite parts of the writing. But just compared to Dickens, I feel like Dickens just like expands your imagination. He like feeds your like idea of what you can do with words to see the world um, mm-hmm. and how to describe the world. And I feel like Tolstoy, I just really don't get that. It just feels so sometimes really dry to me, honestly. And in so many yeah. parts in Anna, especially, I'm just like, dude, come on, please. Um, and it's just, yeah, it just feels very uninspiring, very dull to me actually in parts when compared to Dickens, especially. So like, I think now I can 100% say that I prefer Dickens writing overall um in terms of description character yeah i'm sorry um (laughs) and stuff like that but it's just it's really true like i felt reading anna karenina i was just like yes like i'm here i'm invested i love these characters these are like people i can reach out and touch some of them um which i'm gonna talk about later but just in terms of like the writing it's not a story that i want to follow along with in tolstoy's words um i think i would rather have the story Maybe the movie or something, which I haven't seen yet, but apparently we're gonna watch together. So <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, like, what, okay, I'll just give one example to finish off that point. But um, so like this one kind of has a reason, but do you guys know when like we're in the cities, we're in, um, we're not in the countryside, we're very much in like the society and the domain of city life and society life. Like it feels like there's no structure there. There's no description there. He doesn't describe the cities at all. To him, they are that superficial thing and they require little to no description because there's no substance there. Like it feels like they could just float away or fall away or literally just fall over and it wouldn't make any difference. But I think like as a reader coming to this when I want, not more, not that I don't like agree with him, but I think it's a little bit unfair. And as well as a reader, like it, it makes it really hard when you're like just in this weird floating intangible place Mm -hmm. um and these cities are like beautiful and you could do like dickens and his city writing come on like i know (laughs) but like dickens uses his city writing to like also show the pitfalls of society and stuff like that but we get no description of the building the roads the architecture um and i feel like that stability is just taken away and that also feeds into the stability of the characters who live there which i know is like his you know what he wants but it didn't work for me like at all. So, yeah. I, yeah. I know you feel the opposite though. So I'm really excited. <laughs> well, yeah. See, I feel like where Dickens lacks and where Tolstoy yeah. excels is like understanding people and yeah. explaining people's emotions and expressing them in a way where it can kind of give you place even without those descriptions. You know, like yeah. we learn so much about about agriculture and the country itself, not through vast descriptions of the country, but through the way that Levin feels about it and the way yeah. that he explains his um, his care for his serfs and the people that work on his land. And we get, we get those descriptions through different means, which I think is a power all in its own. Yeah. And I completely agree. Like, um, Dickens tends to be more descriptive and more magical with his descriptions. He likes to be a bit more fanciful. I feel like Tolstoy is a bit more. Yeah, he's not. Um, just like tells you, tells you honestly and realistically, like what something looks like. Or yeah. he does give you those descriptions. They're, they're. I mean, I think that they're beautiful. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but they're they like I understand what you mean. They are different. Whereas yeah. they don't have as much. Um, Fanta- like fantasy elements where I feel like kind of that's what Dickens has. Um, but I, I do have to go back to, I feel like when I get a Dickens character, it's just, it just falls flat for me. I feel like I get a full person with- Wait, all of them? All of, all of all of Dickens characters? Or just like- so far in the early works. Okay, okay. Yes. Okay. And I know, like, we were talking about this as well, like, h- how we're starting with Tolstoy's very strong epics, and we are starting with Dickens's lesser... Sketches. Less popular, and yeah, sketches and novels. The ones that people don't favor as much. I feel like his later works are much more well-known and well-loved and highly 
regarded. Yeah. So it is a bit uneven, but I do feel like the Dickens characters that I have encountered so far, they don't do what Tolstoy characters do. Yeah. Um, in terms of writing, like the way that he writes them, the way that he presents them to the reader. And anyway, my point is, without <laughs> rambling for too long, is just that I agree with you, but I also okay, yeah. feel like you can kind of turn it the other way and say yeah. that maybe Tolstoy is lacking description, but then Dickens kind of lacks the character development. Do you know? I know. I know. <laughs> Um, just to debate you on that, I'm sorry. I know, I know. <laughs> just like, yeah, that was kind of it though. Just in the writing, like, I just, I really love like the way that someone's writing like Dickens can like transform like the way you see a building or the way you look at nature even. Whereas Tolstoy, like he very much gives you that like kind of objective reality view, which is like, if I want that, you know, I can look outside and I see that. <laughs> um, but I feel like with Dickens, I am like inspired to look at it in a different way or in a better way or in a worse way or something like that, which I feel like I didn't get in Anna. So, yeah. but I did, I feel like I got that a little bit more in peace. Like I just really liked warm peace because like, maybe it was the whole sky thing. I don't know. I just, <laughs> I'm hung up on the sky thing. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Stays with us. We love yeah. that. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, uh, we're talking about character. Do you want to, do you want to talk about character now? Um, I just have a few things. Yeah, go for it. Go for about. it. Yeah, I'm just oh, no. trying to figure out. Okay, so okay. one of the things about Tolstoy's writing that I think is his biggest strength is symbolism and foreshadowing, which mm -hmm. I kind of just like, it's just, especially on this reread, because my first read, I wasn't looking, like, I didn't know what to look for, obviously, because you don't know what's going to happen. But then on a reread, you realize that he, he puts so many hints and so many suggestions to where the story is going. Yeah. And you can, it just kind of feels like, like he, I don't know, it's just like genius the way that he did it. And then rereading it, thinking like, oh my God, I didn't even notice that the first time. You can kind of picture him like, oh, I'm going to put these little hints here and there to give the reader um, something to, to hold on to and look for later. So one of the biggest symbolisms is uh symbols is trains and i know that you have something to say about trains uh right now because <laughs> i i can combat it so <laughs> oh okay perfect i love how you're setting me up for <laughs> um okay so trains listen he we know tolster doesn't like trains um like the whole thing with the train and like technology in on a um like i just feel like, the, you know, they represent darkness, they represent sin, they're tied to Anna a whole bunch. And, you know, we have this like invasion of Western technology and whatever coming into Russia. And yeah, you kind of have this like fall from like moral decency and decay of nature and truth. And obviously Levin is a huge part to like fight against that and like talk against that and be like, hey, this is wrong. And here's all the reasons why. And he kind of rejects like technology and the trains and like goes on and on about them. Um, and then in the end kind of finds, you know, faith and like, whatever in religion and nature and all this stuff but I think like if you want to move away from like the progress that like the trains and the technology and whatever and capitalism taking over Russia mm -hmm. um but at the same time the novel also seems to be like a critique of the society and like of that technology that produces like the unhappy marriages and the effects that adultery have which is like a little bit tied right and Anna and the train like that's like mm -hmm. a huge part of the book too but it seems I don't know, it just seems a little bit confusing because like it's advocating for like a, not a stop towards progress or whatever, but just like Levin. It's like for Levin and kind of against Anna. And I know like we were talking about he added a little bit more nuance um, when writing Anna um, aside from just going like after her as like a fallen woman. But I just feel like, I don't know, you can't, I don't know. Like with the way that it's going, like you can't have, I just feel like what I'm trying to say, I think is that like, it feels like a little bit of the reality of the situation is taken away. It feels like he's scoffing at it rather than actively trying to come up with solutions like mm -hmm. for these things or to actually like talk about them um, instead of just like dismissing them. Yeah. Um, and being like, yeah, I don't know. It's like, are you saying what do you want to say first? Cause I think I'm going to like have a better. Um, what, what I have to say is, <laughs> is he just, I feel like it's, it's a perfect example of yeah. how you 
can take something that that impacts everybody, that impacts progression and evolution yeah. through, um, through a society. And it expands transportation. It gives people the opportunity to travel and to do all, all these different things. And it kind of opens up your world's view, like the train yes. system in general. It's giving people more access to further destinations. And I think it's also giving Tolstoy more ground to explore how that affects the people that inhabit the world and inhabit his stories. And the way that, see, I kind of have to get into spoilers for this. I feel like, I feel like we kind of all know what happens. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> spoilers are coming. So okay, um, spoilers, yeah. Yeah. spoilers are coming. So if you want no spoilers then please leave now. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> or, or cl close your ears. Yeah. Um, but okay, so one of the other very big symbols for, well, one of the very big uh, scenes of foreshadowing is when Anna meets Vronsky. She meets him at the, at the train station on the train. And right after that, um, the worker that is at the train station gets killed. And it's just this huge, do you remember that scene? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, it's, it's, I think, the first moment that Anna encounters death and the fact that it happens at a train station right after she and Vronsky meet, it's all of these symbols of, it's like the catalyst to her demise and her death and death at the train station. And I feel like it, it shows different, um, different ways that things can impact people and like that man dies and that's that's his job it, you know it's just mm -hmm. an accident but then it great like it's a ripple effect and it kind of turns into all these different things and we have this mix and this blend of like symbolism and foreshadowing and I'm such a nerd for that that I think like it might be personal preference like maybe I don't know if you like I that hate foreshadowing I don't like foreshadowing really? No, I don't like why. I don't know. I feel like it's also one of the lazy, not laziest, but I don't know. Okay, Watch keep going, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I understand what you mean. Um, but mm -hmm. trying to like, I don't I know, know. It's a hard one to grapple with. Like, mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, what? there's this scene. Um, not this scene. There's this part in the introduction that mm -hmm. I just feel like is worth reading. Yeah. So I'm going to read it. Um, this is from Richard Pavir, who is one of the translators of this edition. Um, where should I start? Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Under the problem that obsessed Tolstoy most of all was death. Death and Anna enter the novel together. Death is present at her first meeting with Vronsky. Death is also present at their first embrace and in their mysteriously shared dream. Death haunts their entire brief life together, but for Levin too, death comes to darken the happiest moments of his life. It gives a stark title to the only chapter with the title in the whole book, chapter 20 of part five, describing the last agony of Levin's brother, Nikolai. Anna surrenders to death. Levin struggles with it and wins momentarily. But even in his victory, surrounded by his family, his estate, his peasants, he is as alone as Anna in her last moments. Metaphysical solitude is the hidden connection between them and is what connects them both to their author. So I kind of feel, feel like that hits all the points. And one of the, another symbol um, is death. Because like he said, like death is always present and it's always on the character's mind, especially especially Levin, especially Anna, because she is grappling with, like, she doesn't really know what to do with herself anymore. So so she ends up like killing herself because she can't, she can't figure out what to do and how to feel and basically is like her own demise. Um, I have so much more to say on that, but I feel like I'm rambling. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about why you don't like foreshadowing and symbolism? Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, I feel like with the foreshadowing of the train, like I just feel like, I don't know, like I feel like in real life, you don't, you know, you don't really get foreshadowing or maybe, do you? Do you get foreshadowing in your own life, guys? <laughs> like, I'm to you. Yeah. 
Maybe, exactly. But I just feel like in Anna, like, like, which is the whole thing with the trains, like, I think, which I don't know, it just like rubs me a little bit of the wrong way when it's like tied to, you know, like the progress. And it's very much like there's like the line between the trains and the country for like, you know, to simplify it for a second. But like, I think, you know, because Tolstoy is very much against big cities, he thinks living in it like corrupts your soul, makes you a bad person, ties you into a bunch of things that can like, kind of destroy a little bit of your humanity and just like make you like lose sight of like what's actually important in life um, and especially your relationship to nature, which is why like Anna and Vronsky's relationship is just absolutely doomed from the start. Like what, like we were saying, it's a bad omen, it's death, it's like the train um, and all this technology that is like coming into effect at the time this novel is written. And then Kitty and Levin's is a success, even though of course there's lots of, you know, problems. And like we said, Levin still grapples with death and stuff like that. But I think like Levin, he's just so interested in like, you know, he wants to like come up with solutions. He's like very um, ready to like tackle problems and like discuss them with people, even when he's like shunned and made fun of and stuff like that. And he's so passionate about agriculture and his serfs and landowning and husbandry and farming. But I think like when the reality, it just feels like, like, like you said, the world is expanding. This is what's happening. We have a huge population. Is everyone going to live on a farm and grow potatoes? No, they're not. And so I think like instead <laughs> instead of just like absolutely shunning the city and being like, this sucks, I think what you should do instead and instead of like just dismissing it is like that's where you need to go to like make sure like that becomes sustainable. That becomes a place that can create good solutions because in the end it is those like places of progress that are going to solve issues <laughs> that Levin wants to be solved. So like, I don't know. I just feel like that's kind of the reality of it and it's not like a cowardly act to just yeah. like step well, away from it but speaking in terms of Levin yeah speaking yeah. in terms of Levin um like I want to I want to go live on a farm in the country too <laughs> but I think like <laughs> um is that is that a reality right now no mm -hmm. um and like that's not obviously what the point of the book is about but I'm just saying um I feel like you know it's not a refusal to acknowledge to, yeah, to acknowledge that the world is growing and that people have to get places and that this is what's happening regardless of whether you like it or not. I feel like yeah, um, you just have to like, you know, make the best of it and try to like actually do something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I think, I think that's the point of why he yeah. does the themes of like why we have so much of the city is yeah. to grapple with the city and the country and you know that's a huge part of the plot because we do get the chunks of chapters of we have Levin in the country and then we have Anna in the city and it's kind of like the and we are getting what you're saying we are getting the Tolstoy's own opinion Levin's own opinion on yeah. what he thinks is right and wrong and which which place he prefers because obviously we have Levin and we have um his love for agriculture yeah. and the country and how yeah benefits him as a person and um and then we have the city where that's kind of Anna's we get um, Anna's yeah. focus which is a very toxic relationship and it's a lot of um a lot of toxicity and mistrust and jealousy and passion Lies, and, yeah yeah and it's kind of like I can see Tolstoy and his opinion even just mm -hmm. in the story breaking breaking it down that way and that was something that I think impacted me more on this reread because the first time I was reading it, it affected me. But this time I kind of felt like it was such a stark change. And yeah, I don't know if it was because it was written in installments or if Tolstoy did it purposely this, this way. But we would have like one chapter dedicated to Levin and it would be really just beautiful and honest and truthful. And you felt like... I just, whenever I read about Levin, it, it, he feels real. And then I yeah. read about Anna and it yeah. felt, not it just, real. It felt false. Yeah. It felt so dramatized and, yeah. and over dramatic to the point where, yes, it's supposed to be, you know, entertaining. And, and obviously these are based on real events and it's also based it on experiences that he witnessed himself, but it was just like, it's, I just find it incredible that this one writer can write such different, can have such different stories to tell in one book. Yeah. The way that those stark changes kind of uh, impact the reader. Yeah. You know, you know? yeah. I mean, Dickens is really good at that too. You know, he like creates five different 
No, okay. Anyway, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, did you want to talk about Anna since we're talking about Anna? Um, or did you have anything else you want to say on that one? I can't. Would you mind if we started with Levin? Okay. 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 We'll start with Levin. <laughs> um, so, Levin is often considered the semi autobiographical portrayal of Tolstoy's own beliefs and struggle, and his story pretty much is kind of reflected in Levin's story. Um, let's see. They, so I was reading online um, that they shared the same social positions, the same wild nature, the same ideas and opinions, the same passion for hunting, the same love of Russian peasants. And Levin also shares um, Tolstoy's method of criticism, which I think we were just talking about. Yeah. It, um, feigned incomprehension. So when, when Levin is in those, those city settings, we get this impression that well one he doesn't want to be there and he kind yeah. of that pretty obviously yeah and also that he it kind of feels like he's making fun and poking fun at at like the people that inhabit society yeah absolutely. which i find really interesting because then you get the other viewpoint where they're when they talk about levin they talk about how he you know oh he's just the farmer in the country he's a weirdo yeah <laughs> pretty yeah. much yeah. um goofy blushes a lot um so just levin as a character i want to kind of hear from everyone watching like yeah. what they felt about levin because i know some people don't like levin or don't sympathize with levin i feel like everyone knows that i love him he's like my favorite <laughs> character, character ever yeah <laughs> um but i want to know your opinion of levin um do you want to share a little me? bit are you yes. talking near to the people? Uh, everyone. <laughs> uh, yeah. I like him a lot. Um, I do think, like, the way... I don't have a problem with, like, him as a person, right? Because, like you said, like, he's someone you can reach out and touch. Um, and he, he feels so complicated. He feels real. Like, I feel like I know who he is. I know what he likes. I know what he doesn't like. Um, I know the way he cooks food or likes oatmeal or something like I feel like I know very intimate details about this mm -hmm. fake person or fictional character or whatever. um but so like I love all of that and like I feel like you know everyone like look at this and we have 11 yeah. fan club happening right now everyone <laughs> loves 11 I love it. <laughs> but yeah but as well like like I said I don't have a problem with this character I just think the way that he's like what he symbolizes at times is a bit mm -hmm hard for me to reconcile with oh I think Levin was my least favorite character throughout the whole book wow right. wow that's, why that's, why that's, help, that's, me. help me, help me yeah, why. elaborate <laughs> yeah um but like yeah like I was saying like I think like what Tolstoy is trying to make him be um mm -hmm. and stand for in terms of like opposition to other things I'm like mm -hmm. hmm not a huge fan especially the ending um with him yes that I hated but I loved the first time I read it but now the second time I read it a year later or two years later I'm like I hate this this is awful I'm trying to keep my anger in <laughs> we okay I feel like do you want to talk about that now or maybe save it for like plot the or intent or something maybe. what do you think I think we, I'll save it. I'll save it for okay. my grand finale. Okay. <laughs> okay. I just want to say as well, like, I do really love it as well, but right, like, in these, oh, I hated the ending, Lucy. Like, I really did. But as well, like, I feel like I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit because I'm supposed to be on Dickens' side. So, like, you can hate me, but don't hate me, like, that Too much. much. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So, yeah. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. See, everyone loves him, though. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and I do feel... Like, I do understand that obviously he's not a per perfect person, and I saw someone say that he felt like the most fleshed out character, and yeah, absolutely. I feel like that's definitely because Tolstoy. Because it's Tolstoy, because it's easy to write about yourself. So of course, yeah, so of yeah. course he's going to go <laughs> the grand finale. <laughs> oh, wait, no. <laughs> when Carolyn takes Emma off the live show. That is my oh, grand finale. Um, but I do understand, like, why people would have conflicting feelings about mm -hmm. him. He does state things very honestly, very bluntly. 
and they are different topics that obviously people have differing opinions on. Yeah. Um, but why I love him is I yeah. kind of feel like it's because, well, Tolstoy, first of all, he gives us the most from his character, so we understand him the most. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, and I do want to talk about this with Anna as well, and I know we were talking about this the other day, that he feels the most tangible. Like, I've never read a character where he he just gives us everything, even like the messy parts. And it's it just feels so real. He feels so raw. And, and I like the fact that Tolstoy gives us his silliness and the clumsiness and just everything. Whereas I feel like so many books, you don't really get that. You don't really get like the honesty of, of a real person. Yeah. Um, it just kind of gives you just the outer layer, which could, oh, you could yeah. argue that Dickens does that. I mean, I'm just saying. I know. I know. But anyway, um, yes, so. What else do I have to say? Oh, something that I found really interesting was that apparently, I don't know if this is 100% true, but I read that um, the way that, and this is a spoiler, but we are in spoiler section, the way that Levin proposes to Kitty with the chalk and the letters. Oh. Okay, 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 hold it, hold it. I don't need your sass yet, okay. <laughs> is the same way that Tolstoy proposed to his wife mm. apparently um which i i know what you say it say it and then i can argue the you know tolstoy likes to be realistic <laughs> yes but but it was being realistic because that's how he actually proposed to his wife with a 20 letter 20 word long <laughs> sentence with the first initial of each word with like complicated grammar and structures and not like simplified versions. And Kitty's like, oh yes, this must mean this, this, and this. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's sweet, it's wonderful, it's lovely, but I don't know. I am mm -hmm. supposed to say something negative about it. I know, I know, I know. Yeah. Hey, you wanted an argument, you're getting one. I really did, we really wanted to do an argument today. Yes, I mean, are you wrong? No. Um, no. It's but, lovely. Yes. Yes. And I do, I do understand your feelings. Um, but at the same time, I kind of feel like, like, it's just so beautiful. It's just the way that like, there's this one quote where it says, um, I didn't know where she, where, no, he didn't know where she ended and he began talking about right. love. Kitty. Yeah. And I kind of feel like they, their love, as, as unrealistic as this is, like their love makes them be able to understand each other in looks, in gestures, yeah. Yeah. in those little chalked letters of the first word, like the first letter of the word, like even though it's so realistic, I, unrealistic, I kind of feel like it's, it just shows like the beauty yeah. of the relationship. Yeah. I know I can't hate on it. I can't hate on it. I'm, I'm trying to hate on it, but I can't. <laughs> um, yes. Okay. And I did. Yeah. Something that I just wanted to state again is just like, in contrast with Anna and Vronsky and Levin and um, no, yes, Anna and Vronsky and Levin and Kitty was just like the vast contrast between the relationships and how. Levin and Kitty seemed so like raw and real and you mess Kitty. Do you think Kitty seemed real? Not as much as Levin. Not as much as Levin. Not as much as Levin. But I do okay, so if we want to talk a little bit more about Kitty, like one of my favorite scenes in the not one of my favorite scenes, but like one of my favorite parts of Lev of Kitty's development is when she goes to the spa. And I know it's one of those like random sections yeah. of the book where it's kind of like what are we doing here? Like we're at a spa. Um, but I sort of feel like it's it's showing her development in progress. And I think where Dickens lacks is character development. And also like when you can actually see the character developing, where mm -hmm. you can really see Kitty learning from what she's experiencing and meeting new people and her kind of trying to figure out what she what she wants because after being dissed 
by Vronsky, then she doesn't really, you know, she just feels distraught and to the point where everyone thinks she's ill. And I just, I think that that's realistic, kind of yeah. showing you like her, her naive viewpoint of love and relationships and how she grows and becomes, you know, this, this loving mother and this very um, honest wife to, to Levin. How do you feel about yeah. that? Yeah, I think, yeah, I would agree with that, that, like, I feel like the development is there, but I feel like, like, right, you have, like, the level of development and you have, like, mm-hmm. one view being exchanged for another, but I feel like Kitty is, in Anna Karenina, is literally just those views and those, like, attitudes. Like, I feel like I don't know her, mm-hmm. right? Like, you have these ideals, you have these things you go through in your life, but that's not, obviously, that's not all who you are, but I feel like I can't reach out and touch her. I feel like I literally know nothing about her except for her attitudes and her mm-hmm. development towards love and relationships mm-hmm. and Levin um, and her family. And so I feel like that's that was kind of all she was for me because in the end, yeah, there it is. She's a manic pixie new girl. <laughs> um, yeah, like in the in the end, I'm like, okay, you you're just telling me what kind of curtains you want in your house, but like I know nothing about what you like or what you like to do. Um, and her whole character just seems centered around her changing attitudes of like motherhood and relationships and all the stuff we already mentioned. And like, just compared to Levin, like I love, we love Kitty, but like, she's so easy to love because like, what, what are you not, what is she, what are you not going to like? Like, yeah. um, and so I don't know, I feel like she became more of just an extension of like Levin. Um, yeah than someone in her own right because she doesn't and like it is easy it's easier for Tolstoy of course to write Levin but Mm -hmm. like we really don't get those scenes like with her aside from those developmental scenes um which was really disappointing to me so yeah I mean I do yeah I understand and I um uh something that I just wanted to share was this comment um Dickens tells you uh, it happens whereas Tolstoy shows you, and that's like one of those one of those things that you learn about in like cr- creative writing courses, like show don't tell. Um, Actually, I disagree. Really, in Anna, especially, I feel like he just I feel like it's a mix in Anna of showing and telling, and like Dickens, like I don't know if he's actually said that. I think I read it somewhere. Anyway, um, but I feel like so much of this book was just person A sits down and like talks to you for twenty pages or talks to person B for 20 pages about their views and whatever, and then person B talks back. And, like, you have so many scenes like that, right? Sure. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, like, you know, you don't – I feel like we don't go to the places. I feel like Dickens actually takes us there, right? He takes us to the workhouses. He takes us to the streets. He takes us to all these places. And, like, I feel like he actually does show us with, like, beautiful language what but, is actually but, happening there. But Tolstoy yeah. takes us to the fields. He takes us to the city. He takes us to yeah. the fields. You can argue the same thing, though. I guess, I guess. But, like, I just feel like so much of this book was just talking. And I really didn't like that. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't like following someone's debate for yeah. 20 pages, whereas I feel like he could have just shown us in, like, different scenes in a better way. Ooh, wait, we have an argument. Oh, yes. That the but emotions are shown. And that's where I feel like Dickens lacks, is because, well, okay, in some cases. I won't say all yeah. the time. Yeah. But I think like Tolstoy gives us like what they're feeling through the omniscient narrator, obviously yeah. taking us taking on the the emotions of the character in the third person, kind of all knowing. And I feel like by doing that, we understand all of the characters, their feelings, their actions, and we may not agree with them. We may agree with them, but mm-hmm. it it just gives you a, a full rounded view of who they are. Yeah. Whereas I don't think Dickens does that. And not yet. Not yet, guys. He doesn't do it yet. But maybe maybe soon. <laughs> um, yeah. True. Yeah. Um, okay, kind of like, I feel like the last thing I want to say about Kitty, if yes. I feel like you're ready to talk about Anna for a second, I just mm-hmm. don't like her. Like, I don't like them and their rivalry. I Like, I understand why it occurs, exactly. but like Anna and Kitty. So, oh, yes. Um, like in in the course of like the events that actually happened, like with Vronsky, fine, you can be mad at each other, like you kind of broke her heart, whatever. But in terms of like the juxtaposition between the fallen woman and like the angel and stuff like that, like I feel like you can like 100% really simplify their characters down to that. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And like, it is right. That's like, that's what Tolstoy started out this book trying to do was like examine the fallen woman and be like, Oh, look what she's done. And she has to die for this. Um, and like, you know, he develops throughout the book, but in the end, like it still ends the same way. Yeah. Um, and I just really didn't like, like kind of, you know, what their characters do to each other when placed in these stereotypical yeah. roles. But at the same time, it's yeah. not realistic though, because if this happened, like it's kind of a basic love triangle, even in the, even in modern day, you know, like the, the two girls fight over the one guy and obviously one gets like burned. And I, I do feel like it is as much as it's dramatized and it's a, it's a classic. So it yeah. happened years ago, but like I was saying earlier, even though this was written so many years ago, it is relevant and it is kind of talking about those timeless scenes of like love and passion and um, and sort of like figuring out who you want to be with. And, um, and I think it's explored through their relationship. And I understand why there's a rivalry because without that, Kitty would have never married Levin. They would have no, never no. married Do you know, yeah. like, yeah and like I know I know why it's there but yeah. that's always my like um yeah. my explanation of why the book is titled Anna Karenina because I always feel like everyone forgets about Levin and it makes me so angry <laughs> because, because the book is like I think the book is more about Levin than it even is about Anna and but why I think it was titled that is because like Anna's actions influence everyone else's to the point where if Anna wasn't there none like none of the events would have happened the way that they yeah. happened yeah if that rivalry wasn't present yeah obviously Kitty wouldn't have married Levin and um and all of the relationships would be skewed and you know like there wouldn't be the um, I want to talk about this more a little bit later, but like the concept of um, childhood and the the children that Anna and Vronsky have, and Anna and Karenin. So yeah, like yeah. basically every like all of Anna's actions are a catalyst to everything else. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I really want to know because like guys, Carolyn would not tell me last night. <laughs> um, you said that when you read it the second time around, like your feelings for Anna and your view oh. on her and her husband, Karenin, like changed Completely. drastically. Mm -hmm. Like, I just, I just want to know, spill it. Okay, okay. <laughs> so the first time I read it, I was like, so pro Anna. I was like, he's cold, he's unfeeling, he's a machine and he's a cruel machine when angry. And I was just like, so frustrated with him. Yeah hated his character and I like did not understand him and I thought he was horrible. And Anna, I was like, well, of course she's she's acting this way. You aren't giving her the love that she needs and you're not even like give, caring about your son with her and she is this great mother to Sarioja and you are so cold to him. And you don't care about his well-being and his future. And you're just like, I was just so, so mad at him. And, and I felt very sympathetic towards Anna. And then on this reread, I was, I started out that way because I was comfortable with those emotions. Yeah, you were coming from there. That's what, yeah, yeah that, I was coming from those feelings of my first read. And the more I read, the more I realized that Karenin is completely justified. Like his wife, you, his wife cheats on him and, and expects expects him to what can fly like I don't know my my emotions for her my sympathy for her completely vanished and I kind of felt like I was angry with all of her scenes because she was just like um complaining and and saying that her life is ruined and I kept thinking well it's your own fault like you're at like you mm. are you know like you dug this grave and now you have to lie in it kind of thing and I don't mm. oh yes you disagree? I'm just gonna. I'm, I don't. I get so nervous when people <laughs> yell at me. Wait, who's yelling at me? No, you're, no, you're not. You're absolutely not. I feel like, like I don't. I kind of agree. I'm like on the fence, but I think like I don't think they dug their own grave. I feel horrible for both of them, and I more want to blame. Like I just think the whole system, the whole society, is just. It's, it, it creates these situations yeah. where you yeah. have these impossible decisions. Mm -hmm. Your life's going to be ruined either way. Um, 
And I think like when you try, like obviously you shouldn't go about it in the right way, but when you're so constricted and so confined and like obviously we see the, like how Oblonsky gets away with it and no one cares. And it's just like pretty That's much never meant to talk about it too. Yeah. Yeah. But then of course, when it comes to honor, like the situation is completely different and it doesn't make it any more, it doesn't make it right is what I'm trying yeah. to say. Yeah. But like you are in this position where you stand to like ruin people's lives because the system is just so toxic mm -hmm. and there's no way out. Um, even if you do, even if you're brave enough to like file for a divorce and like you can like reconcile the rest of your life being tarnished in this and like people, like you don't even become a person anymore. You just become an exile. Mm -hmm. um, so like, I don't know. It's so hard to like, yeah, I don't know. I think in the end, like I feel so bad for both of them because it ruins both of their lives yeah. and their children and like all the other children. Like I feel so bad. Mm -hmm. or like her son and stuff like that and her daughter so Definitely. I don't know I don't know um, I do feel like um I was just gonna yeah what was I just gonna say I don't know <laughs> this always happens <laughs> <laughs> um oh wait oh, god we're talking about Anna yes and you don't sympathize sympathize with her that much anymore. oh oh yes 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 um okay where like so because people were asking like how do you feel about karenin and yeah. um a lot of people are saying that like they that he was one of their favorite characters and that he was like so complex and i oh yes this is it okay it just came back to me um that i had a light bulb moment when i was rereading and i thought like oh my gosh I know why I dislike Karenin so much on my first read is because we get him through Anna and we so like whenever we're getting the Anna scenes obviously it's a third person omniscient so it, the narrator's taking on her view of every everything else and so of course she describes his hands as like veiny and swollen and his balding head and he kind of paints this really horrible picture of him and as the reader you she's like um, an unreliable narrator because is that a true portrait of him? Yeah. And that's what I found really interesting and that's what I think is incredible about Tolstoy is he can give us a character and manipulate their our view of them through the other character's view of them. And it's just this whole big, like, yeah. I don't know, web of, of trying to like find the honest truth about each person and but it also says a lot about Anna's character and and how she views him it is a reflection on her own personality and her own growth. And I just, I and then we get um, Steva's point of view, Steva's opinion of Karen. And when Karen comes to him and says to him, I'm divorcing your sister, it, it just, it blew my mind on my second read of yeah. like, because I, I, I saw it very like cut and dry, like this character I shouldn't like, this character I should root for. And then the, my second read, I was just like, it's just, it's not black or white. It's not, it's just a mess kind of. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So wait, how do you feel, honey? Wait, how do I feel about what? Um, Karenin. Like, uh, I just feel bad. I just feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> Um, did you get that same feeling about like getting an unrealistic picture of him through Anna? I think so, but as well, we are given scenes like alone with just him mm -hmm. where he's off doing his thing. Yeah. Um, and I was like, okay, how unrealistic is this really? Um, because the scenes where he's alone and then he, the whole thing with, um, oh, what's her face? Like the crazy lady at the end who comes into his house and it's like, oh, we must consult the cards um the the whole woman who be, he becomes friends with oh oh lydia yeah lydia like we get that whole thing um i thought you were so, talking about oblonsky for a second no I no 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 <laughs> um yeah yeah okay sarah sorry sarah's comment oh, that's yes. also very interesting um yeah <laughs> that's, that's so funny, it's so funny. Sorry. I, I think yeah i think it's like it's very purposeful, the little descriptions that Tolstoy gives us because he does give us, yeah. um, like he always mentions Vronsky's balding, like the more that their relationship kind of crumbles. Um, they need yeah. <laughs> they need <talk> <laughs> oh, oh, 
um, um, yeah. Oh, and then, okay, I really yeah. want to talk about them as parents, as like okay. parent figures, because I feel like this kind of went sort of not unnoticed by me the first time, but I kind of feel like it hit me differently on my reread was the first time I read it, I thought that Serioja and their uh, Vronsky and Anna's daughter Annie should be with Anna because Anna was always the one just showing them care and love and and sort of having their best interest at heart. That's my perception on my first read. And then this read, I thought, well, they they should go to Karenin. And it was, I don't know, I just, I was reading it and I was like, am I actually thinking this right now? Because it was just such a different view of yeah. how I felt on my first read. And I kind of feel like Karenin could give them a less toxic environment to grow up in. And I think it, it benefits the children that they end up with Karenin because, well, obviously Anna kills herself. Like, is that a good uh, and healthy mother figure to have, you know, like, what are your opinions? Oh my gosh, about the custody of the children. <laughs> <laughs> well, or just just how, how you feel about how they both dealt with the aspect of who should get the child and how they both treated him. And I think, like, I think it's pr I think it's pretty messed up that they were like, "Oh, your mom's dead." Yes. Um, like I just feel so bad for them. Like it's it's kind of just like a lose, not a lose lose, but like obviously yeah. there's no systems like today. There's like there's gonna be no joint custody or anything like that. Like it's gonna be one or the other. And like, mm -hmm. um, like yeah, we're talking about Anna's really not in a good place because she's been like she's just gone through all of this stuff and she's like dealing with all the consequences of her actions, yeah. um, and the system and like it's not. <laughs> like unfortunately it can't be a good place for them yeah. but as well like Karenin is he is very cold and like removed from them and as well like he says that like his child becomes or no does he say that his child becomes hateful to him because it reminds mm -hmm. he reminds yeah, yeah, yeah so I was just really feeling really yeah. um angry with his father because he he saw Anna as this like angel this perfect this perfect mother figure even though he left her, which I kind of feel like is showing you that maybe maybe it was because she was the one that cared for him so much as a young child that that sort of stayed with him. And I know later on we get Sarioja older and he sort of doesn't have any feeling for his mother eventually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which I think is h horrible and made me just like so emotional just to think about and yeah the one thing that was keeping her from going with Vronsky was like how she would lose custody of her son and then and then she does and it's kind of like well what did you expect like it is a it is a part of society and it is it's a result to how like the system in in general works yeah. um, I don't agree with of course because it just is not fair at all um but how she felt about Annie, um, she she didn't she didn't care about Annie as much as she did Serioja. And the the way that the scene works out, where after she gives birth to Annie and um, and Karenin is there and they hold hands and they forgive and Karenin forgives, um, it was just one of the most powerful scenes in the whole whole book, and it really just like hit me to the core and the fact that like it, I think it's Tolstoy kind of showing you what forgiveness can do and the beauty of forgiveness and um and the way that he immediately loves Annie and cares for her and one of the scenes explains that the nurses got were um originally started feeling very uncomfortable with Karenin always being in the nursery but then yeah. it he grew comfortable and we're used to him and it just like Tolstoy shows us how how much he cared for her to the point where he was always in the nursery he was always looking out for her and this is the child of his wife's infidelity mm -hmm. it just, that just blows blows me away yeah you know I don't know it was just it hit me so different on this reread and I just, I don't know, my 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 viewpoint of all the cast yeah. is completely different. Yeah. And I was not expecting that at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you think, 
Because I'm trying to think in terms of Dickens, like how Dickens portrays um, like the parent child relationship. And um, because I do feel like Tolstoy gives us a very like brutal portrayal of it. And he, he shows us that, um, that society yeah. can influence the way that you treat your child. And of course, how they eventually grow up and learn and become yeah. like, themselves so I don't I don't know like it's like Dickens like there's so many orphans in mm -hmm. Dickens which is like a thing but I don't have we read a Dickens yet that's like a good parent like nothing no not this mine no um, yeah. but you know what I find ironic though is Dickens' own relationship with his father especially was very problematic um so I guess Star Wars <laughs> from my point of view is evil. oh my god okay this is, yeah it's, the, it's like the second last one. Oh my gosh this one yeah okay <laughs> oh my um Anna is canceled. <laughs> See, I just feel so, I just, uh, I don't know. Um, like, I sympathized with her, but like at the same time, I really don't feel like I had a good grasp of who she is. Mm -hmm. um, other than like Dickens, or poor Tolstoy, wanting to write like something about fallen women. Um, mm -hmm. But as well, like, I don't know, I have it, I have it in the point where I talk about um, the ending. Okay. Well, so, yeah. Um, I think the next part, do you want to go on to plot? I feel like there isn't much to say. Yeah, about I don't have much to say either. No, we've been talking about it just like overall, but yeah. one thing that I have written down in my notes is just city versus country, Levin versus Anna, just like, because basically the plot is broken up into those things. And I was saying before, like how the structure really impacts the view of the reader and how the reader kind of goes about understanding the characters in these settings and yeah. how setting and society and the setting in general impacts a person's emotions, a person's actions and kind of um, how they respond to, to the things that happen to them. Yeah. I, you, sorry, like, I really agree oh, yeah. with Sarah's thing okay. I was like yeah despite her mistakes until she decides to manipulate Levin for fun yes like, what are you girl what are you doing yeah 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 which I do find really interesting um how we get the whole book with like their different viewpoints and then we get the one chapter where they meet and I kind of feel like it's one of those moments where you know like in <laughs> in movies or like TV shows where they do like crossovers where they yeah. have like actors yeah. from different shows come yeah. together on like one of the shows. It kind of felt like one of those moments. And it, it's just so interesting how Levin has this view in the beginning when he hears about Anna and what she did. And he is very like, um, it just, he just, it just goes like, on and on. He just, yeah. yeah. He, he has he his just, rant. Like, he, yeah. He judges her and, and her actions. And then he meets her and he's like, oh, she's so charming. And what a beautiful woman. And <laughs> I was just like, oh, 11. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, I did feel like it was one of those moments where Tolstoy did feel kind of like, like, I see what you're doing there. Um, evaluating, because I feel like it's sort of Tolstoy's own view of Anna as well, like seeing her as this fallen woman and then getting to know her through writing about her and trying to understand her and sympathize with her to the point where you can't help but also fall in love with her because she is so outwardly charming. Is she? I didn't get that at all. I'm well, like, where's the charm? Where's, where's the charm? Tolstoy? I see. I think that that's, that's where the strength is. Like, we get her inner turmoil whereas no one else does she has to put on a brave face for society so of course she's not going to give that to the people that she meets no no she yes. it's Vronsky because she's always like you're lying to me you don't love me anymore um but I do feel like it kind of shows you how false 
she has to be to the outward world. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, okay. Do you want to talk about the ending? Because I'm interested. Um, yeah, I can go through the end. Okay. Um, okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. How am I going to say this? Okay. So we have the end and Anna kills herself. She throws herself under a train. Um, and Levin, even though like he gets everything he wants or everything he thinks he wants, like at the end, he still, he still says that he wants to do the same thing um, for some reason. And anyway, like I get it. Like he's, he's been struggling the whole book, like with how to live life and how are you supposed to go on living when everything's going to come to an end anyway. But like at the end of the book, we have like Levin's whole Anna is reduced to like her last thing is one sentence from the mouth of like is it Vronsky's mom I think who's just like oh my gosh this like hideous witch blah 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 and that's it that's like how she she ends yeah it's people's view of her after yeah. she dances. yeah yeah and then Levin like through it just really wasn't clear to me but he finds faith um and he like you know he, it's very celebratory for him it's like a an awakening um, and something that he's like, okay, this is how I'm going to live my life. This is what I'm going to do. Um, like a small point there. I didn't think that was, I didn't know where that came from. Like to me, it kind of just came out of nowhere because he goes through the whole book being like, I don't believe, I don't believe, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end, you know, like we were talking about last night in the thunderstorm, it's like this like lightning bolt moment Carolyn was saying, but I don't, I don't really get that. Um, but the bigger problem with the ending with me and what made it a little bit just, seemingly like a slap in the face and kind of vaguely hypocritical if you want to look at it that way is that like Tolstoy I feel like he just didn't really consider that that which motivates Levin to keep on living to keep living life to not kill himself to just like go out and be good and like have life in front of him faith and religion is also the same system that worked to perpetuate the laws and the circumstances and the constraints that led ultimately to Anna's death. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like if the novel is really truly a critique of like the system of marriage and law and divorce and relationships and stuff like that and their effects on men and women and how it's completely unbalanced and also just as a whole um, not good, um, I feel like the ending is just kind of a slap in the face because Levin gets to experience all of the goodness of the side of faith and religion, but also the same system is what basically killed Anna. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just like, how can you, it gave me so little hope because I'm just like the same. I, I feel like maybe Tolstoy didn't really, cause Tolstoy was right. He was very, or I don't know how religious Tolstoy was. Actually. Um, here, read this comment that just came up is very good. So, uh, Tolstoy yeah. wanted to love in the ending he wanted because he struggled with fate all his life. And I think yeah. it's another example of Tolstoy kind of, um, reflecting yeah. an image through Levin and, yeah, I think it's because like, and I'm sure it's the same for Tolstoy how it is for Levin that he's yeah. surrounded by people who are full of full of that faith, mm -hmm. and he kind of I feel like it's one of those things where it's like, well, what's what's wrong with me? Like, why don't I have? Why don't I believe? Um, and I think it's he has to go through everything in the book in his life to sort of understand, and he finally does. And I think it's it is a way to like neatly tie up the ending yeah uh, because i kept thinking to myself like what if he ended it with anna's death and like that was it and we didn't get the scenes with levin like first of all it would be very unsatisfying i guess as a reader because you want to always like you want to you want the best for the characters that that you care for and um but i do feel like you're right in terms of you know it's it's all mixed in together and I think that when he realizes that he does believe it's I don't know like is it him trying to convince himself or is it like true I don't know I don't know. see like I'm less concerned about that I'm, I'm like I don't care if that's like good for you I'm happy for you <laughs> but I'm like it just seems very like I don't know if it kind of just like goes over Tolstoy's head because he finds faith in the end and having struggled with that his whole life it's something he finally like you know that's what he has now and it's amazing for him and like we see how great it is for Levin and that's all well and good but like we also see the negative effects of like the church perpetuating and like being the huge thing in a, in a part of the things that like caused 
the awful systems that hurt everyone in this book. So it just mm -hmm. kind of felt like, which one is it to me? Yeah. yeah. No, I agree with that. I don't know. Yeah, I do. I do feel like it's Tolstoy kind of being like, oh, well, you know, this is what love can do. Like now Levin has but because it's we we end with the scene of all of the people um, together and we have all of them interacting. And it's I think it's Levin kind of realizing what he has. Yeah. And he's always questioning his belief and um, and God and faith. And I think it's finally he he steps away from that. And by stepping away from it and seeing what he has, he realizes that that is where the faith lies in a sense. Um, but mm -hmm. I do understand your point. Like, I don't know. I just felt like it was like Levin goes his whole thing with like, no, like I'm my own person. I don't need to be defined by faith or religion. And I'm like, he is an outsider, but then he's also an outsider in like religion and in, yeah. um, the thing that everyone else shares in around him. Yeah. It's just, it's such a big part of Russian society that I think it's hard to kind of take yourself away from that. I know, yeah. But I think as well, like, Tolstoy's very concerned with, like, the traditions being uprooted in terms of, like, uh, the technology and the trains coming in and, like, getting rid of what was there. But I think, like, you do need to get rid of some traditions and you do need to prune things that don't work anymore yeah. um, and that haven't worked. And I think that kind of just, like, missed the mark. Yeah. This yeah. this, this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> It's true. Very yeah. true. Um, let's see. Yeah, see, I like this. Um, I think people in the book needed to find something to hold on to in dark times. Dolly found the comfort in her family. Levin found comfort in his faith. And Anna couldn't find anything for herself. And um, I also kind of, that's, that's um, wanting me to talk a little bit about Steva and Dolly. I, mm -hmm. we, is it okay? I know we're like getting no, wrong. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to be like taking too much time. Um, but we did talk before about, and I just want to go back to it, is the, the perfect example of how a man can be unfaithful um, but he isn't reprimanded in the same way that a woman is. And, and we have the relationship between Steva and Dolly and how it's, it's horrible because we see that Steva continues to cheat on Dolly throughout the entire novel and kind of um, not take care of his family and doesn't care that much for his children. But, but it's all like on Dolly, like, um, yeah, I feel so sorry for Dolly too. But yeah. at the same time, I love Steva. And so there's, I know. This, right? I know. And I there's hate myself this, for it. I know. I know. Yeah. Because you see that Steva is this kind of, basically, he's, he's not a good husband. He's, he's not a good father in the general sense of like providing for your family. Um, and it shows you just, the the tragedy of of society and how because she's a woman dolly if she divorces him because he's being unfaithful she will lose basically everything and and just like the scene where she talks with anna and and anna kind of tries to convince her not to leave mm -hmm. um Leva Blonsky, and then Anna goes and does the polar Yeah, it's just it's so frustrating. Um, yeah, but I do want to. I wanted to ask you how you felt about a Blonsky because I didn't know how you would. Um, is that a pair you've got there? <gasps> is this a pair? <laughs> is this a Blonsky's pair? <laughs> I was really waiting for someone to yell about it. I think someone did see oh, it. Oh, did they? I'm sorry. I think I didn't so. Yeah. Um, but we have a Blonsky's pair with us. Yeah, like I think Oblonsky, like he was everything I wanted to feel about Anna, but I mm -hmm. didn't at all. I um, like mm -hmm. Yeah. So like I think it was it was well done the way that he did it, like the critique. Um yeah of, you know, like, we still fell in love with Steva, even though he's a 
bad word. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like it's just, it's just really good of Tolstoy, honestly. I have to say that. Yeah. Um, but thank like, you, <laughs> thank you, Emma. Do you want to say that again? <laughs> no, no, I said it once. You have it on like you have it on record now. So. Okay. <laughs> um, but like he was, he was. Tolstoy said he was charming, and he was charming, mm -hmm. and you loved him for that. But, Can we talk about how yeah. Tolstoy described his almond butter smile? Did you get that description in your translation? I don't think I did because I would have remembered that. Okay, yeah. In in the Pavir and Volokonsky translation, they describe Oblonsky's smile as like almond butter. And I just found that fantastic. I was like, thank you, Tolstoy, for giving that to us. Yeah, I know. Sorry, um, keep going. No, that, that's honestly it. Like the last mm -hmm. comment that, yeah. That's it's just it. interesting as well how like, what doesn't what does an almond butter smile even mean? Exactly. <laughs> I don't know, um, but it sounds great. Smooth and and buttery. <laughs> expensive. Almond butter is expensive. Mm. What are we even on about? I don't know. Um, yeah. Steve had one job. <laughs> Very true. And he was not successful at his one job. Oh. Um, not peanut butter, though. <laughs> um, but yes, OK, let me just make sure. I said everything I wanted to say about Steva. Um, someone commented that that he. Well, let me see if I can try to find it. Hmm. Sorry, let me just. It was like you care about Steva because because um, Tolstoy writes him to be likable. Yeah, yeah. It's true. And even though he does these not nice things, um, we do still care about his character. And we do. Yeah. I just feel like he's the humor of the book for a very uh, uh, sad not, reason. Yeah. Yeah. Like not he, it's not a solemn book. It's so beautiful. But I feel I feel like where we have Dickens, he's like always funny. Even in the hard times, he's like cracking jokes. I feel like that was Tolstoy's way of sort of making light of hard situations. And yeah. I think him like poking fun at a, at society because I feel like Oblonsky is like the heart of he loves he loves society and he loves um taking advantage of what he can as a male that can sort of do whatever he wants and knows that he does he yeah. won't suffer the consequences. Um so yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dolly and Sonia should get together. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Oh my god. Um Okay. I'm just making sure I said everything. Yeah. Oh, we have to repost the uh Oh yes. Okay. Remote. I'm going to go on my YouTube right now. And I'll have a another vote on YouTube and Instagram. Okay. Oh, do you want to share your two quotes, Emma, while I do this? Oh, my gosh. Wait, I didn't do it. <laughs> Guys, she's unprepared. I'm going to go get the book because I have one highlighted, okay? What kind of professor are you? And not a good one. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll be back. I'm going to go get okay. I don't have the book with me. This is awful. Okay. I should get a vote just for that. Oh, she's, see, she can't hear me. So I could, I could win this. You guys should vote for Tolstoy. Um, okay. This is weird, I'm alone. Okay, I just posted the second poll on YouTube. I will now post the other poll um, on my Instagram story. 
Something I want to say as well, like looking at this quote is like, I feel like Levin, not that he's a worse peer, but I feel like when he deals with like the philosophical questions and stuff, like it's just, it doesn't, I don't know, it just doesn't live up to the warm piece, like amazingness kind of thing. Like he barely scratches the surface. Let me just take this knife out of my heart really quick. <laughs> okay, anyway, do you want me to just read this? Okay, yeah. this is my quote number one. Um, this is from this is from like the end of the book somewhere. Um, okay, without it's 11. Without knowing what I am and why I'm here, it is impossible to live. Yet I can't, I don't understand that. But anyway, yet I cannot know that and therefore I can't live, he said to himself. But this is like the cool one, I think. In an infinity of time and an infinity of matter, an infinite space, a bubble, a bubble organism separates itself and that bubble maintains itself a while and that bursts and then bursts. And that bubble is I. I am a bubble. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I like that. So. Andre is an oak tree. Levin is a bubble. <laughs> um. Do you, want, do you want to share your other one or do you want me to share one? You go, you go, because I don't want to. Okay. I, have, I have two. One is more um, commonly loved. The other one I think not too many people talk about. So I will share the more popular one okay. and then the less popular one. So this is when Levin sees Kitty for the first time at the skating rink. Um, he stepped down, trying not to look long at her, as if she were the sun. Yet he saw her like the sun, even without looking. Just, just loving. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, this one, this one was like the other one I really liked. This one's about Vronsky and Anna. Um, oh, this one was just, this one was like my favorite. It was, oh, it's just so awful. Um, okay, it's Vronsky being like, he felt what a murderer must feel when looking at the body he has deprived of life. The body he had deprived of life was their love. But in spite of the murderer's horror of the body of his victim, that body must be cut in pieces and hidden away, and he must make use of what he has obtained by the murder. Wow. Tell story. Come on. Yeah. I know. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Also, very good, Sarah. Very, you know me very well. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah, she likes that one too. <laughs> Levin is looking at it. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, that's so funny. Okay. Um, my second one is after Levin and Kitty's child is born, like right after. Um, it says, like a small flame over a lamp wavered the life of a human being who had never existed before and who, with the same right, with the same importance for itself, would live and produce its own kind. Hmm. I don't like that one. <gasps> so rude. How rude. I feel like in the first debates, I really Blocked. Started, like, <laughs> Blocked. Exit live show. <laughs> what were you saying? No, nothing. I feel like this is good. We're getting more... Uh... I don't know, honest. <laughs> Getting honest. But I just, I think it's so, like, like a small flame over a lamp, like describing them swaddling the baby and the new life and how that baby is going to make like more babies and the generations are going to keep going on. And there are so what we're going to need for that. We're going to need trains to carry all those babies. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love how upset you guys. I don't appreciate it. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I wish I was breaking this. That's what we wanted, though. Oh we were like, gosh. I'm going to break this friendship. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Um, all right, let me just see what the poll is on YouTube. Wow, okay. 3% Dickens, 97% Dawson. Oh, that's rough. 
Um, did everyone did everyone vote on the second Instagram as well? Let's see. Ooh, hold on. Okay, we have um, eighty three percent Tolstoy, seventeen percent Dickens. If you want to vote on in the comments as well, you are more than welcome to. Um, let me see if they're updating. Okay, twenty seven people voted Tolstoy, five people voted Dickens on Instagram. So that's five. Sorry, did you say five? I said five. <laughs> I feel like, okay, let me just say, I feel like we need to host the polls on like an impartial uh, account yes. because I oh, feel right. like on your, when it's your turn to do Tolstoy, right? It's always on your channel and you are Tolstoy. That is true. That is true. So maybe Tolstoy. the other person should, should post the poll. I don't know. Maybe we should just create like an Insta account or something for it. Would um, everyone like an we'll Insta we'll Tolstoy? I just feel like Dickens is getting snubbed, you know? Uh, well, that's because... but maybe he is. He probably is, though. <laughs> I don't know. I think Tolstoy is going to get snubbed when Dickens pulls out A Tale of Two Cities and Great yeah. Expectations and Our I Mutual so. Friend. And, yeah. I hope so. Um, oh, here we go. Optimistic. I had a rocky start with Dickens, but I'm 40% into Nickleby. And guys, Dickens is getting better finally. Amazing. I am so glad. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see here. Um, oh yes, DVT Instagram. Okay. All right. Oh, Mary, a tale of two. I can't wait to read a tale of two cities. Yay. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. Do you have any closing thoughts? So we have you, what? Oh yeah. Wait, what were we gonna say? I just said, do you still love me? I don't know. I'll have to think about it. <laughs> yes, I still love okay, you. Okay. Yes, I still love you. I don't have my voting card here. <sighs> How disrespectful. No, I'm kidding. It's okay. You could just, we could just shout it. I think everyone knows. I don't... Okay. Yeah. Oh, wait. Someone's asking what the next book for the debate oh, yeah. is. The next book is Nicholas Nickleby. And we have two months for it. Originally, we were just going to do one month. But this book is like, what, 800 pages? Eight, yeah, eight something. Yeah. We are giving it two months. Um, so October and November. No. September, September October. October. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, let me just... <laughs> Should I is destroy the pair of friendship? <laughs> you have to throw it at me. You have to like throw it out your window, and then it'll like circle all the way around to uh, yes. Canada. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, who are you voting for? Oh wait. Uh, yeah. But I'm just checking the polls. Oh, oh my gosh! Because Dickens uh, might get six. <laughs> Dickens has eight. Dickens oh, good for him. Has Thirty-seven. Wait, let's see. Okay, we have, we began with two hundred and fifty-three people voting for Tolstoy, forty-nine voting for Dickens, and now we because not a lot of time has gone by. Like I, I'll post the winner maybe like tomorrow at one thirty, so that we have like full, um, full day to go by. We have thirty-seven for Tolstoy, eight for Dickens now, but. I think I think tables are gonna tr gonna turn when it gets to the, the later books. Yeah. Okay, we are at an hour and a half. I think you guys are probably tired of us. Um, <laughs> so, uh, okay, let's vote. Okay. You, you go first. I know. No, uh, Tolstoy. It's gonna have to be Tolstoy. <gasps> just for today. Just for today. But I was after... just gonna, gonna throw the pair at you. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like for right now, because it's been War and Peace, right? And I do want to judge it on like what we've read so far. Um, and the Pickwick Papers and Oliver Twist, they weren't it. Mm -hmm. um, but like that's going to change. So. Okay. Okay. Why are you? All right. Our friendship is intact. <laughs> okay. Amazing. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. Everyone, I'm voting Dickens, by the way. It's never, is it ever going to happen? <laughs> uh, yeah. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. 
Yes, kidding. I voted Tolstoy, if that was not clear enough. Um, <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my God. All right. So this has been a pleasure as always. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think we have any updates, right? Just Nicholas Nickleby, two months. Um, it should be the sec- the first Saturday of November. November. Yeah, but if any if any dates change, then we'll obviously post about it. Um, but yes, this was so fun. Yay! <laughs> I love it. I yeah. love it. Love it so much. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad that we have all of you guys to uh, nerd out about Dickens and Tolstoy with. So, mm-hmm. all right. Thank you so much for watching. If you stayed for the whole thing, you're great. Um, thank you for sticking around with us. <laughs> And yeah, it has been a pleasure. So, see you guys in November for Nicholas Nickleby, yeah. which will be on Emma's channel. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>